Okay. All right, there's our little reminder. So from here we are recording. I'm gonna go ahead and start, start my intros because it looks like we've got a pretty good group on so far. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Amy Hartle. I am the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the Breast Cancer Network of Western New York. Um, I know that I sent this out personally to some of my own contacts. So we may have people joining us from not only Buffalo and uh, the surrounding Western New York areas, um, but also perhaps from other parts of the world or at least the country. So we're glad to have you here tonight. This is such an important topic and I have no problem owning up to the fact that one of the things that I was not uh, expecting or anticipating with um, my breast cancer diagnosis and treatment even choosing to have surgical menopause uh, because uh, or surgical um, forced menopause because of my risk of ovarian cancer, I really was not prepared for um, what would happen to my pelvic floor and sexual health when it came to um, the experience of going into forced menopause and then having, because I had an estrogen fueled cancer, um, having the, um, having the, uh, my, my uh, estrogen suppressed even more. And it's, it's really taken a toll in a lot of ways. And I actually found um, Dr. Olson and, and her company, Intimate Rose, and just in my own search for answers um, and for information. And so we're so glad to share this with you tonight. Um, again, I'm gonna ask you to please have your microphone muted so that it doesn't, there's no accidental background noise. Um, this is being recorded. And again, you're welcome to have your camera on or off. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. If you want to try and ask it in real time or not forget, we will do actual Q and A at the end. Um, but otherwise, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I would recommend that you put your view to speaker view so that uh, Dr. Olson will be the main person in your screen. You might see a couple of other little boxes, but that way she's going to be the largest image on your screen and you'll be able to see her um, and her presentation the most clearly. I have experienced a lot of what she's probably going to share here today and I will tell you that it's fascinating and helpful and we're also going to um, talk a little bit at the end uh, about where you know how you can continue this your education and your work in this area. So, you know, we're going to this tonight's a jumping off point. It's to get you started. If you are someone who's experiencing issues in this area, um, or if you didn't even know this could be a problem, um, just, you know, we're going to get you started. And then our goal is to help facilitate uh, how to take things to the next level, whether that's through products, whether that's through working with someone in your local area, like a pelvic floor therapist, um, you know, or if our finding other ways, other support to talk about it. Um, I will recall, I will do this, say this again at the end, but just a reminder for our local participants that our classes at BCN, our, our, our health and exercise classes um, are still running live um, and our support groups are still meeting. Uh, they are meeting virtually right now. And uh, our next um, speaker series in March. I will announce that again at the end. Uh, right now is definitely planned. It will be on Zoom for sure. We are still debating whether it will be in person or not. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Amanda Olson to introduce herself and start this evening's presentation. So thank you, Dr. Olson, so much for being here. We're really, really grateful. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I, I love the work you do and how, how cohesive your group is. And, and just, I, I love it all. You're doing such important work. Um, my background as a healthcare provider is that I'm a pelvic health physical therapist. Um, uh, our profession has been around for 40 years, but a lot of people are just now starting to become aware of it because it's been um, promoted both in the mainstream media and in social media a lot more. Um, but as physical therapists, we have doctorate degrees and we also have then additional training on pelvic health and healthcare as it pertains to the bladder, the rectum and everything in between. <laughs> um, and so additionally, I also have a company called Intimate Rose where I create products 
that help to empower people to manage their symptoms on their own that are dealing with highly sensitive issues like urinary incontinence, pelvic pain, bladder pain, um, things to that nature. So when we talk about pelvic health as it pertains to breast cancer, um, all, of, all of you, all of us as people prior to that diagnosis, and I have not had breast cancer, but I have had pelvic floor injury, there's a lot of different ways that the pelvic floor can become injured or have trauma to it um, that would warrant the needs of a pelvic physical therapist. An interesting thing that I found and that Amy and I have talked a lot about is that in breast cancer, a lot of the focus of the healthcare providers on your team and in your family and in yourself is on the breast tissue itself and on the initial diagnosis. And a lot of times those providers are working very hard as a team to help manage that, that cancer diagnosis and the resulting plan of care. And they forget to mention some of the side effects as it pertains to the pelvic floor. Cause there are so many other side effects, whether your plan of care involved chemotherapy or chemotherapy and surgery or radiation, you know, whatever that was, all of those things can affect the pelvic floor. And we're going to talk more about that to begin with, but a lot of times because they're so focused on the initial important work of getting that cancer diagnosis managed, that part gets left out and then you're left dealing with it, wondering what on earth happened. <laughs> and oftentimes um, feeling, feeling like you were, were not prepared. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some of those ways the pelvic floor is um, affected. And then we will talk about how it's commonly managed. So this is a pelvic model. This is the front of course, and here's the back. I'm gonna tilt it a little bit. Everything you see here in red are muscles. And these are muscles just like everywhere else in your body. They can be strong and they can be weak. They can be too tight and they can be too loose. They can have scar tissue from having babies and having surgery and having radiation to that area. Um, and they can also be really well coordinated and not so much with the coordination. <laughs> these pelvic floor muscles start at the pubic bone swing wide to where you sit and then come all the way back to the tailbone. And there's several layers here that I'm gonna show you. They also surround the urethra, the vagina and the rectum. So you can see there's a lot of different muscles. When we talk about the pelvic floor as a group, it's kind of like talking about the rotator cuff of the shoulder. They all, they all perform similar functions, but there are discrete different muscles there. They house the pelvic organs. Mine are a little jumbly. I have pelvic floor dysfunction here. <laughs> I'm gonna arrange them so that you can see them here because it makes sense then why the bladder, the rectum and the vaginal tissue may have one teammate that's playing well and one teammate that maybe needs a little help. So in the top of the bowl here, so if you can imagine this is your abdomen, breast tissues up here and the pelvic organs are down here. In the very back, you see the rectum in the middle are the vagina and the uterus, the uterus sitting at the top of that vaginal canal. And then right in front is the bladder. One of the first things that you'll notice are these are three organs that are three tenants in a very tight apartment. <laughs> and their walls are just thin fascial walls. There's not a lot that protects one from the other. So these are three organs that need to all be getting along and they need to be sitting atop a supporting and well-functioning pelvic floor. I'm gonna take the organs out now so you can see the top layer. You hear me okay? Here's the top layer. So this was the superficial layer. So underneath all those organs, you see another big plate of musculature and you see it swinging all the way from the pubic bone here, all the way out to the sides where our hips are and then all the way back to the tailbone. So that is the general anatomy. So different cancer treatments can affect this differently, starting with the effects of being put into menopause, just as Amy was just talking about. So whether that menopause was induced chemically 
um, through hormone therapy and chemotherapy, or whether it was with surgery where you've had full hysterectomy and removal due to possibly having cancer in both places, or uh, perhaps a um, associated risk of having cancer down below. Being put into a state of menopause can do a couple of things. Structurally, if you've had surgery, the removal of an organ is going to leave behind a gap. As you saw, all those organs are all snug as a bug in there. And if you take out an organ, the bladder and the rectum are gonna sit differently. They're gonna sink down a little bit into this pelvic floor. There can be some scar tissue associated with that. And also now in your vaginal canal, you have a cuff. So if I'm the vaginal canal, now we have some scar tissue up here. What that can mean is there can be some pain resulting from having scar tissue in there, can produce some pain with intercourse. So having penetrative intercourse and bonking up against that scar tissue can be really tender. And then also it can produce a sense of heaviness because those organs are not sitting against each other. Now they're sinking down below. I wanna highlight a couple of things. One, scar tissue can be disruptive to the muscle itself. It can also produce pressure on nerves and vasculature, and that can result in pain. Don't ever let anyone tell you scar tissue doesn't hurt. It can, and it does, and that's a real thing. If you're having pain, you are, you are not going nuts. It's, it can be mechanical. There can be a lot of different drivers of it, but scar tissue is definitely one of them. The good news is that there's a lot that we can do and I'll talk about the role of pelvic physical therapy in just a moment and how we manage it. Um, someone just asked about radiation, I'm on my way. <laughs> so next, next radiation to the area. Radiation to the area can cause changes in the tissue. It can cause it to be more stiff. So we would have less flexibility here. We can also have something interesting called stenosis. Um, particularly if you're having radiation to broad areas in through the abdomen and the pelvis and the genitals, um, that can produce closure around the vaginal opening here that can make penetration, whether it's to have an exam with a speculum or to have penetrative intercourse, also very challenging, if not impossible, and also painful. So also additionally, looking at the effects of chemotherapy and being in menopause on the vaginal tissue itself, it is automatically going to become more dry. Estrogen creates blood flow to the tissue, which is something in a cancer uh, diagnosis that we're very concerned with. We don't want that. So that, that serves its medical purpose when they start not having estrogen on board and not having blood flow to the area. But when we're thinking about in healthy tissue with estrogen, being naturally produced by the organs, that makes the tissue very pliable. It produces moisture in the tissue, so it makes it so that there's less friction. Um, and all of those things make for flexibility, elasticity in the vaginal tissue. And it also can help produce kind of that pleasurable glide during intercourse. And when that's gone, not only is it gone from a structural standpoint, but it can change how we want to interact with intercourse. It can decrease sex drive. Um, it can decrease how we feel about ourselves, how we look at ourselves. Um, and also when it doesn't feel good because of that loss of moisture and we experience kind of um, friction or something and challenging during the intercourse, our brain says, ouch, that hurts and it will automatically try to guard you and protect you, which can include spasming and closing of the pelvic floor muscles. When that happens, you're not doing it on purpose. It's reflexive. So the same way when the doctor bangs your knee, boom, and your leg kicks out, your pelvic floor muscles can guard to protect you against pain, even though you may be trying to engage in something that you know is not harmful or threatening and you want to do it. They're still saying, no, no, I remember last time it didn't go well. And those muscles are then trying to close and protect you in that way. So that would be a coordination issue. So from a pelvic health physical therapy standpoint, when you come to us, we are going to be spending a lot of time talking with you about your medical history and about what your goals are. So we're going to go through your complete medical history, talk to you about um, what are the symptoms that you're having. We're going to ask you how about your bladder. How is 
How is continence status going for you? Are you going to the bathroom a lot? Are you having accidents? Are you having um, pain when you urinate? We're also going to ask you about bowel movements. It's all the fun things. This is how we make friends. <laughs> we ask about, are you experiencing constipation? Are you experiencing diarrhea? We're trying to get a sense of how those three organs are functioning because they can drive each other a little nuts in there. Um, so we'll ask you about bowel movements and how that's going. We will probably ask you about pelvic pain and about if you are having pain with penetration, whether it's having a speculum exam or trying to engage with intercourse. And then we will ask you what your overall goals are. Where are you trying to get? For some people, they want to be able to go on a long car ride and not feel like they have to stop every 15 minutes. They want to cough or sneeze or laugh and not pee their pants. And they want to be able to have sex with their partner. Some people, maybe penetration isn't a goal right now, but maybe in the future they would like that. So we're going to meet you where you are and we're going to form that plan of care to get you there. We do an assessment where we look at your posture. Um, having surgery, especially around the breast area can cause changes in how we stand and that can alter the pressure on the bladder and on the bowel. It can change how you breathe and how you breathe affects the pelvic floor because the diaphragm where we breathe and the pelvic floor work together like a piston. So if this is the pelvic floor and this is the diaphragm, when you inhale, the pelvic floor drops and so does the diaphragm. So you inhale and draw down with your diaphragm, the pelvic floor drops and you exhale and it raises back up. When we start having shallow breathing or restriction in scar tissue around the diaphragm area, that can affect that natural flow and put some pressure on the pelvic floor as well. So it's not only just about how the pelvic floor is functioning, but the entire trunk, the hips, even all the way down to your feet. So we took a really, we take a really solid look at your posture and how you stand, how your spine is moving, how your hips are moving. And then typically we will do an assessment of your pelvic floor on the first day. If you're having a lot of pain or you have a history of trauma, that may be deferred. But what the vaginal exam gives us information about is how healthy the tissue is, what's the tissue state, um, how pliable, and then also the strength the endurance, the coordination, and the ability to relax of all of the pelvic floor muscles. So we'll ask you to bear down as if you were going to have a bowel movement. And we're watching to see, do your muscles remember how to do that? Because sometimes after surgery, or radiation, or chemotherapy, that coordination can be disrupted as a natural byproduct of altering the tissue, altering the blood flow, altering the nerves. We're also gonna ask you to do a Kegel. And we're watching to see, do the muscles close and lift? And then generally we do an exam just using one finger. In physical therapy, we don't tend to use a speculum. We know that that's really uncomfortable and we don't need the vaginal opening that wide open. So with one gloved finger, we put it into the vaginal tissue and we assess for the mobility there. We're checking to make sure it's really pliable. We'll ask you to do a Kegel then and we're measuring the strength. So we wanna see how strong you are. And then we'll ask you to do another Kegel and hold it as long as you can. So we're looking at the endurance of the muscles. And then we'll ask you to do 10 Kegels in a row and we're watching for the coordination of the muscles. As I mentioned, those are all different components of pelvic floor muscle health that are important if you want to sneeze and not leak urine or be able to relax to have penetrative sex. So we gather all that information and then we create a plan of care based off of your unique needs. Part of that plan of care can include manual therapy. So doing trigger point release. So interestingly enough, the same way that you get a knot in your neck or your shoulder or your back, these are muscles just like anywhere else. And they can get knots in them, especially if you've been guarding and holding a lot of tension there as a way of protecting yourself or out of stress. Um, so manual therapy can address all of those. Um, we can also use biofeedback, which is um, a, a device that allows us to monitor the pelvic floor muscle activity and show you on a screen. We can use some ultrasound imaging where you can actually see your bladder in the pelvic floor. And then oftentimes we will use products 
to help you manage your symptoms at home and get you further. And also as a means of continuing your self-care after you discharge Then physical therapy, our goal is to get you where you need to be to the point where you don't need to be coming into appointments all the time. Though we love having you, we know you have better things to do with your time. So one of the tools is dilators. Um, these are the dilators that I create at Intimate Rose. Dilators, as you can see, are a cylinder device. Ours are made of medical grade silicone and they come in pretty colors. I wanted them to be very cheery and happy and not look scary. <laughs> so as you can see, the smallest dialer is about the size of my pinky. We're getting ready to launch a new product. Um, you may have heard me telling Amy that our anal dilators, for those who have anal and colorectal cancer, the smallest dilators in that set can also be used vaginally too. But the point and the goal here, particularly after radiation and after chemotherapy, is to be gently training the vaginal canal and the pelvic floor muscles to be able to tolerate something for penetration, whether it's that speculum for exam or penetration with a partner. So if this is the vaginal opening here, the dilator is used to gently be able to train that tissue to be able to open and eventually get in. And then you can be doing gentle mobilization of the tissue there. And then eventually you would move on to the next size. So the, the point of having graded dilators is to make it gentle and progressive. We have eight in our set here. Um, and to make it so that you're not just training the tissue, but your brain. So the point is not to put on the TV and try to grit your teeth through this session. This is not a no pain, no gain type of physical therapy. If you've ever had physical therapy on your knee or your shoulder, that's a different planet. <laughs> we don't do that in pelvic health physical therapy. It's meant to be tolerable. So if you're thinking about pain, and I know there's a lot of talk about pain scales, but if zero is nothing and 10 is the emergency room, we want your pain at two or below when you're using the dilator. And some days are easier than others, but you're gonna use plenty of lubricant. So you're gonna put lubricant on the dilator and you're just working with your body. There's a couple of different types of protocols and depending on uh, what your pelvic physical therapist and what your oncologists are seeing and, and what they're used to, different protocols involve 10 minute sessions, three times a day, and some are 30 minute sessions, one time a day. I say both are effective and it comes down to your schedule. For some people, it makes more sense for them to put in a session in the morning, and at lunch and at night. And for some people, they're at work all day. It doesn't make any sense trying to dilate three times a day. They're saving it for the evening when they can come home, close the door and really engage and then do 30 minutes then. The outcomes are very, very similar. So we're doing low load, long progression training with the dilator for that. Those are dilators. Additionally, another tool to use our pelvic wand. So these again are the intimate rose ones. These are ones I created. Um, they have different functions, but again, they're made of really smooth silicone. These are intended to be able to go in and do myofascial release or trigger point release inside the pelvic floor muscles. So it can go into the vaginal opening. Um, the wands can be used on men and women who have had these kinds of procedures done. So for men, they use it rectally. For women, you can go vaginally or rectally and both ends work in different ways. So this little curvature here is meant to come into the vagina and hook right under the bladder here for tender points that are in those muscles right underneath the bladder. Oftentimes those can be driving a sense of bladder pain or urgency to urinate. Um, so releasing tender points in that area is really beneficial. And then the longer thin end is meant to be able to come in and sweep all the way to the sidewall. You see how it goes all the way out to the hip here, and then also all the way back to the tailbone. The purple one is the original one. It's the first one I created. And then the other two have different functions. Turquoise vibrates. For people who have had chemotherapy and radiation and surgery to remove the uterus, vibration can be very, very helpful to stimulate blood flow to the area for healing and improving the pliability. 
The other thing is vibration itself is very, very soothing. So it helps to address the muscle itself. So this one vibrates, it has 10 different frequencies of vibration on it. So you can pick the one that feels best to you. Some people respond really well to very high frequencies and some people like them softer and lower. So vibration there. And then this yellow one is temperature therapy. It can be hot or cold. So it can be placed into the freezer to retain cold or it can be placed under hot water to retain warm. Your preference as a person plays a big role in which one's gonna work best. If when you're sore, a ice pack feels and sounds like exactly what you want and need, typically in the pelvic floor, you're gonna respond well to that cold therapy. And that can be especially true as in the stages of healing, if you're roughly eight to 12 weeks out of surgery, sometimes having that cold in there can feel really good, especially if you're starting to get up and moving again and returning to some of your activities and you feel a little flared up. I detest cold. <laughs> I am a warm person. So um, for me, always running it under hot water is the key. And you, you know who you are, right? If the idea of sticking a popsicle into your vaginal canal sounds like the worst day possible, then you're going to probably respond to warm. But there are, it's six to one half dozen to another. I can tell you people are loving the, the ability to have it very cold. Want to highlight the importance of being very generous with your lubricant, whether you're using a device or you're trying to engage in some sort of, whether it's outer course or foreplay or intercourse, using plenty of the lubricant is a really good idea. Get a towel down one to two tablespoons. That sounds like a lot, but when you're considering that your body can be absorbing it, particularly if you're really dry in that particular day um, and reapplying readily, so keep it handy. Amy and I have had this conversation that's really fun, and it's that lubricants are so personal. It's almost like shampoo. So when you find the one that works for you, like stay with it. And then, it, you know, you can always be trying new ones, but everyone responds differently to different lubes and everyone appeals to different qualities in a lubricant. So just do your homework. Sometimes it's helpful to have a couple of different um, kinds on hand to trust and try and find what works best for you. Yes, perfect question. Someone's asking about silicone versus water-based. So for medical grade silicone products, such as mine and others on the market, you have to use a water-based lubricant with the device or a natural oil. So water-based lubricant or coconut oil, avocado oil, whatever you like. You can't use a silicone-based lubricant with medical grade silicone because they don't play nice together. And in fact, it tends to degrade the surface. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it's happened enough in other products where the FDA makes this uh, general recommendation and we are FDA registered and compliant. So we have to say water-based lubricants with our products, but sometimes it's helpful to be having a water-based lubricant for use with the products. And some people really like the slip of the silicone-based lubricant for intercourse. So whatever suits you, whatever feels like it's working best, is the right choice for you. The last device for urinary incontinence, so the previous products were talking about pain, vaginal weights are to address urinary incontinence, which can certainly happen, as I mentioned, particularly if you've had hysterectomy, um, there's a lot more pressure on the pelvic floor. If you've also had childbirth, so if you've also been pregnant, delivered babies, whether it was via C-section or vaginal delivery, all of those things can change the pelvic floor. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways to affect our pelvic floor in addition to cancer. And so we've all lived this life and then you add on this other thing and sometimes that can create these new symptoms. Um, but the vaginal weights are intended to strengthen the pelvic floor to address urinary incontinence, um, which is also a common uh, symptom after menopause period. Um, so the white weight is 25 grams. So the weight goes in just like a tampon would, except for not all the way up. It sits right in the vaginal canal on the pelvic floor. So in our model here, it goes right inside the vagina to sit right inside there. The pelvic floor muscles are then tasked with maintaining that weight in. If the pelvic floor muscles relax or are fatigued, boom, the weight will drop out. So you can do active Kegels with it, or you can train endurance. And the way you do that is place the weight in, 
and then take a shower or do something else for 10 to 15 minutes. The pelvic floor muscles are working to keep the weight in during that time. And then afterwards you get to take it out. So that's a really nice way to multitask, especially for busy people. But as the color purple gets darker, so here's white and it goes to darker pink, the weight gets heavier. So they're stepwise and progressive to help you get stronger as you go. The last item for addressing dryness is balm. So balm is like lip balm, but for the vulva. So it's like chapstick, but for down there. Um, ours is organic. It features um, essential oils and um, beeswax and other natural oils to help heal. And you can see there, it looks like lip balm. I've also been informed it's a really good eye cream. So <laughs> that would be an off-label use. Um, but for this, I just recommend applying as needed to the outer parts, the vulvar area of the tissue, particularly if you've undergone radiation or have had some sort of either chemotherapy or surgically induced menopause to help with the outer dryness, particularly if you're going through environmental changes, like when it's very cold outside and your skin is naturally more dry. If you've shaved or waxed, this can help reduce that dryness. It can also help soothe the tissue so it can heal. Um, and we've gotten rave reviews from people and I've seen it in my patients too, where it really does help the overall quality of the tissue. If you can imagine, I'm in Oregon now and it's been pretty cold here. You know, when your hands are chapped and the tissue is thinner and it's more irritable versus when they've had lotion on it and it's summertime and it's just more plump and ample. And so that is the effect of using a balm down there. So given all of that from anatomy to pelvic health, physical therapy to management, what questions do you all have? That is so awesome. Okay. So, um, someone is asking uh, about physical therapy. Are there offices in Buffalo? So Dr. Olson is not local, unfortunately. Um, but there are, there are pelvic floor physical therapists here in Buffalo. For those of you who are local, um, there is, uh, uh, Kathy Kiggins is at sister's hospital. Um, and you know, there is, if you ask uh, if you if you if your oncologist is at Roswell, um, they had opened up a sexual health clinic. The main doctor, Dr. Moffat, recently left, but they are making referrals. Um, the other thing that you can start to do is, and I found this really helpful, was I found a urogynecologist um, in my area, which for me is here in Buffalo. Um, and if you look up urogynecology, they treat specific issues. Like they're not your typical gynecologist. They're usually dealing with things like urinary continence or, or pelvic floor pain. Um, and they are a good one. They're a great resource to be able to find a pelvic floor therapist in your area Two, Um, they also, um, uh, they they understand. Um, so if you're someone who experiences significant pain with any kind of, uh, vaginal penetration, um, they actually know how to work with that. Um, that was the, you know, in, it's been four years since my own diagnosis and treatment, since I went into premature menopause and, uh, this past year, that visit was the first time that I actually was comfortable and managed to get through a visit without pain, not because their pain didn't exist, but because she took her time, was willing to work with me. And even went so far as to use lidocaine cream, which if you ever had, if any of you had a port with chemo and they gave you numbing cream to put on your port before they accessed it, she basically used the same stuff. And I was a little scared of that, but man, did it work. And it made the process so much easier. And so I've, you know, having people who understand and specialize in this particular area of health can be really beneficial. Um, we're going to, I'm going to find a way for those who are on the call tonight to follow up with some local resources. Um, but I do know, I do know sister's hospital has a physical therapist. Um, and there are a couple others in the area who, who treat pelvic floor um, who, who deal with pelvic floor therapy. There's also a couple of ways you can do it. And there are benefits to both. There are those who, uh, take insurance, like the one at sister's hospital is associated with insurance. And, you know, she is going to be, I, I went and saw her myself. They are going to be bound by some of those, uh, stipulations of insurance, how many, you know, there's going to be an evaluation and then they're going to have a protocol for how many sessions and how long they can take with each session and that sort of thing. Um, the, you know, the, the, 
that's wonderful. And I highly recommend if you have insurance that will cover that, do it. But there are also, I know in this area, a couple in private practice, um, and I don't have their names off the top of my head, but I'm going to work to get them. There are a couple in private practice and the benefit of someone in private practice, even if they don't take insurance is even though it's self-pay, they aren't, they aren't held to those same limitations. So often you can get, you know, more treatment or longer sessions or, or something that's really tailored to your needs in that way. Um, so uh, someone asked, and I'm going to turn this over to, to Dr. Olson, how frequent are the PT visits for this type of therapy? It's dependent on how many factors you have involved and your goals and all of those. But I will say I typically see patients once a week for an hour um, for roughly the first four to six weeks. During that time, I'm giving a lot of education, answering a lot of questions and doing a lot of manual therapy and then giving homework. After that point, the information has been downloaded <laughs> onto that person. And often that, oftentimes the patient is progressing and they can benefit from more time in between the treatment. So oftentimes then we'll switch to every other week or once a month. And um, I would say the length of time of that relationship ranges from roughly three months to sometimes a year, which sounds really long. But when you're considering if around say like the fourth month point, you're going once a month, um, it's, it, it puts it into that context. And I can say that a lot of patients aren't ready to go. You know, they just enjoy having that progression. And um, we don't discharge until someone has met their goals and they're completely ready to manage on their own, but it becomes a really um, foundational relationship, a really special relationship. So sometimes it can go on longer and you just come in for tune-ups as needed. Um, and sometimes you just really hit the ground running and you do amazing and you're done and you're ready to go live your life. And we love that too. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple other questions I'm going to get to, but I want to just share um, first, you know, for the people who've never experienced something like this, uh, I, I did go to pelvic floor therapy and, you know, I've certainly had gynecological visits before and, and I didn't really know what the difference would be like, but this is actually, a, at least in my experience with, with one therapist was a really soothing, relaxing, um, experience. She made sure that I was comfortable. I spent time at the beginning of every session, basically with like, you know, those nice heated packs that you can put in the microwave that sometimes they put on your back during massage, or you might have one at home for your neck. Um, it was sort of like having a diaper made out of one of those and just helps kind of put you into a, a better state of relaxation. So everything is a little bit easier when you get started. She certainly worked within my comfort level and my tolerance to make sure that anything she did, she explained what was going to happen first. Um, and, you know, the thing about a lot of this stuff too, is that um, it's okay to try different things at different points. For some of us, it took, it took me a couple of years before I was ready to start working on this. And even after going to physical floor, uh, pelvic floor therapy and making some progress, um, you know, I kind of, I stopped going to therapy and I kind of fell out of the, whatever, there were other things in my life that just kind of became more important. And, and now I'm back to working on that again. Um, I have a dear friend who went through her breast cancer experience nine years ago, and it really upended her, her sexual, um, life and, and with her husband, and, you know, it, it's taken this long, but this past year, she really made it a priority and she's really starting to bring that aspect back into her life for herself and with her partner. Um, and, and that's okay. Like this is, this is something that it's okay to, you know, it's, it's not a, a it's not a, um, a quick fix. It's not something that is a win or lose situation. It's really about learning where your body's at, what your needs and goals are, and then trying a lot of different things, um, to, to make it work. So, um, we had a question about, and thank you for clarifying, um, uh, uh when it comes to say prolapse, if there's, um, uh, pelvic floor prolapse, at what point would you need surgery? You know, at, at what point might therapy not be able to help that anymore? Sure. So there's two, there's two stipulations around that. So when we're considering prolapse, there's a couple of different grades. So I'm going to use more anatomical landmarks. And I would say a surgical candidate might be somebody who their bladder is completely out of their body, you know, so a complete prolapse of an organ, maybe they're able to replace it back in or a descent that is just so low that it is the organ is um, past the vaginal opening and constantly 
out and there appears to be injury to the ligaments that suspend it. Grades less than that, we can strengthen the pelvic floor, reduce the scar tissue and pressures above, and we can often reduce it by up to two grades in pelvic physical therapy using conservative measures. Um, so I would say the very severe cases, but the caveat to that is that some people in that condition with complete prolapse are not surgical candidates due to a medical status. Um, so then it becomes a more complicated discussion. Um, one of the things that I will say is that I've seen that procedure done well, and I have seen that procedure done horribly. Um, I always recommend if, if you find yourself being recommended surgery that you get at least three opinions by three different practitioners in three different clinics. <laughs> um, because I've seen people who were deemed surgical candidates that their prolapse was very mild and we were able to fix it conservatively. Um, and then there are also just surgeons who don't have the same techniques as others. Um, there's great surgeons out there, just the same way there's great physical therapists out there. And there are ones that could maybe use an extra year of training. <laughs> So I always recommend getting at least three to triangulate what you are hearing and to be able to make a decision where there's no conflict of interest from the person delivering that information to you. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Uh, so someone asked, can we order weights from you to be used with a physical therapist? She lives in Brooklyn, so she'd have to find someone locally. Yes, absolutely. They're available on our website, which is intimaterose.com. Yeah. And we are going to, like I said, we'll be following up with um, this recording is going to get posted uh, on our YouTube channel and we will be following up with um, an email out to everyone who, who was on the call tonight or who registered for the call with a link to uh, Intimate Rose. I will tell you, I haven't personally tried the Kegel weights because that hasn't been my issue, but I have tried, um, I have, I do own and, and have used the dilators and the pelvic wand and they are incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I have tried other dilator sets and I love Dr. Olson's by far um, the best because of the smooth texture. They're very velvety. Whereas sometimes, even though they're still, they still say medical grade silicone, sometimes they're kind of shiny and like rubbery. And that just doesn't have the same effect at all. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's surprising that they, um, they really do. You can really start as small as you need and kind of work your way up. They come with, uh, you can get a handle so that like they have a handle so that if you have trouble reaching, say, um, you can use the handle and that, that makes, uh, accessing, um, you know, uh, penetration with the dilator much easier. Um, the wand is really helpful. I, one of my first indications, even without, um, kind of the, the vaginal atrophy and, and all of that, uh, one of the first indications I had that something was going on with my pelvic floor was um, not long after my surgery uh, and chemotherapy ended, I started having very bad tailbone pain. Like I would go to sit on the edge of the bed and I would pop back up. And what I came to find out is it was actually basically trigger points. The muscle yeah. was so tight in that pelvic, right? Yeah. And where it the muscles that attached. And so the physical therapist and I did work with those muscles to, to help loosen them up and, and soften them and relieve those trigger points. And I have not had that tailbone pain since. And what was really one of the best things about it was not only getting out of the pain, but recognizing there's this whole other part of my body. And I'm, I'm a massage therapist, but obviously, you know, in, in licensed massage therapists, we don't work with, unfortunately, or, or probably for the best, because it's not our area of, of focus, but we don't work with the pelvic floor. So we're not even taught those layers of deep muscles and realizing that there was this whole other, um, layer of musculature that, um, that one that, you know, could, could have this impact, but two that I could have an impact on really helped relieve things. Like, of course, my, my brain first went to, oh, it's gotta be cancer. The cancer's back. It's in my tailbone or something. And to, to realize that there's a lot of the times there are more comp there, there's more likely scenarios. And, um, so, so again, just helping to get educated on that. And, uh, so we'll get you the information for Dr. Ols for, for intimate rows. Um, and yes, you can order them. And, uh, you know, certainly if you go to a physical therapist, a pelvic floor therapist locally, they may have, 
brands that they like as well. Um, but this is a great place to start. And I will say that Dr. Olson does an amazing job of having um, videos and information. So there's a lot of understanding of how to use the products yourself. Um, I'm a big advocate of both and find a physical, you know, find a pelvic floor therapist, find a professional to work with and do the work at home at the point when you're ready for it. Um, someone asked, did you ever hear of doing Kegels by squeezing the anus rather than the vagina? I was recently taught that by a nurse at a urologist. My treatment was for urinary incontinence. Okay. Um, so you're going to put me in a position where I have to tell you that nurse probably wasn't advising you well. Um, here's the anatomy of the pelvic floor. Here's the urethra. Here's the vagina and here's the rectum. So you can see how the pelvic floor muscles, as I mentioned, has different components to it. So when we focus on squeezing around the anus, we're actually contracting muscles that are about as far away from the urethra as we can get. And if we're concerned about the bladder and urinary incontinence, we wanna be focusing on the anterior muscles. So a cue that is better for that versus kegeling around the anus, which would be good if you were having fecal incontinence, is to um, imagine that your urethra in the front of your body is a telescope and you're trying to pull the telescope up and in and focusing your kegeling effort from your brain to that front part and to the middle part around the vagina. Another good cue can be to imagine that you're trying to pull a blueberry up and into the vagina or that your pelvic floor is a claw and you're gonna get a little stuffy, little stuffed toy from the arcade game and it's gonna close and pull the stuffy up. So those cues focusing at the mid layer and the front are gonna be more effective when done in volume. So you can't just do three kegels a day and expect to get dry. You gotta do 10 and you need to hold them for at least three to five seconds and do it for multiple sets. So um, I don't mean to, to speak against what that nurse said, but anatomically that's inaccurate. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. That's helpful. And um, certainly, you know, there's clearly a purpose for doing giggles with the, around the anus, but yeah, that makes sense. And, and that's really helpful to kind of have that visual uh, anatomy lesson too. Okay. We have someone who asked, could lower back hip pain be related to pelvic floor issues? Yes. They are all members of a musculoskeletal team. Absolutely. So here's, here's your hip. So this is the the head of the hip and here's the long bone of your leg and it attaches right here. Right inside of that are the pelvic floor muscles. So having a big knot or a trigger point here can send a referral pain that feels like hip pain, but it's actually coming from the obturator internus muscle, this deep rotator muscle within the pelvic bolt because you can see how far wide it swings. Um, additionally, there are other muscles in the back. So again, here's the, mus the, the leg bone. The muscles go like this and they attach onto the back fascial wall. So having restriction in that can also create tightness and issues on the pelvic floor because they share a fascial, just a thin, tiny piece of tissue. These aren't compartments. They're all connected. Everything's connected. And then the back, depending on how your back moves or doesn't move, depending on how flexible you are, that can oh. alter the mechanics onto your pelvis as well. And then if you look at the back, some of those nerves exit out the back and come down into the glutes here. And then all of these little holes here on your sacrum produce nerves that go into the pelvic floor. So any compression there from the joint or from muscles that are too tight or from using your back improperly can result in changes in the pelvic floor. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to those muscles, um, there's other ones that like, there's a muscle we call the, the front back muscle. It's the psoas it's our, it's a hip flexor yeah. and it attaches like from the front of that spine there. And it goes down through all of that. Yep. And into onto the in, uh, deep inside of the femur. Physical therapist and, didn't do any of this with me. <laughs> I'm going to mute you there, uh, just so that we, we can, um, there we go. Um, so Dr. Olson, I'm going to ask you to say something. So you come back and oh, sure. interview. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Great. Okay. I'm probably taking back over now, but, um, so anyway, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of 
muscular issues that can actually cause and things we don't even think of. Like, so if you go say for a massage and someone's only working on like maybe your back or your lower back, it, that's not necessarily going to be the root cause of back low back pain, even if it is muscular induced low back pain, there, there is a lot more that can go into it. So, um, those are something to think about as well. Um, okay. We got a, we have a question. Uh, there are commercials mm -hmm. on TV for drugs for urinary incontinence. What is your opinion on those and are they ever appropriate? They are appropriate for people who have a true neurological diagnosis of overactive bladder. So what that means is for people who have, so the bladder has muscles in it. Um, and sometimes they can be overstimulated coming from their, um, from their spinal cord or sometimes um, from injury lower uh, down in the nerve as it approaches the bladder. Um, those medications tend to be appropriate for that specific population. But in order to properly diagnose that, that person would have to see a urologist and undergo urodynamics testing to monitor the behavior and activity of the bladder itself and of that detrusor muscle when the bladder is full and to see how it responds when it's emptying. Um, so those, that class of medication is really overutilized and poorly understood by the people that prescribe it. A lot of times I see primary care physicians prescribing some of those and um, it's, you know, it's a pelvic floor muscle impairment. Um, so that, that is, that is what's happening with the, the drug class. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I would just like to add that, um, you know, th this is obviously a very specialized area of physical therapy. This is not your typical physical therapist. So it is important to find someone who, who understands and works exclusively or, or specifically with pelvic floor therapy. Dr. Um, Dr. Olson, is there a good resource or a good way, even, even just kind of anecdotally for someone to know, like, are there certain credentials or certain letters that are helpful to look for? Is there a website that, you know, within, within the profession where someone could go and be like, oh, this is, you know, find a pelvic floor therapist by zip code. Like, is there something like that, that you could share? Yes, those websites do definitely exist. Um, so first and foremost, if you email my support team, support at intimaterose.com and share your zip code, we will match you with someone in your area. Um, other places include a site called Public Guru, and she also has a finder for all the different types of pelvic floor providers, including sex therapists and um, pain specialists, so pain doctor specific to pelvic pain and pelvic floor physical therapists. Um, in terms of credentials, there's a couple of different types. Um, PRPC are my board credentials. Um, it stands for Pelvic Rehabilitation Certified Practitioner. It means I'm board certified as a pelvic health practitioner. WCS means Women's Clinical Specialist, and that's a board certification that would include pelvic floor and lymphedema as well, specific to women. Um, so I treat all the pelvises and all the people. So mine's a more um, broad spectrum pelvic certification versus the Women's Clinical Specialist, but that WCS and the PRPC are the initials that you're looking for. That's fantastic. Thank you. And again, uh, we will make sure to get those, uh, to share this as a follow-up. Um, we'll get that, uh, Dr. Olson's and Intimate Rosa's email. Um, that is such a generous offer. Thank you for, for offering to match people because that's, that's huge. And, and that's often one of the hardest parts is just not knowing how, you know, I mean, it, you, you go to the great Google, right. And you might get lucky or you might actually end up with someone who really doesn't know what they're doing. And then you have a bad experience and then you're turned off and, you know, stops right there. So, um, that's, that's fabulous. I'd also like to take a second to normalize for anyone on this call who may have learned a lot or even had your mind blown a little bit tonight by whether, you know, the, the anatomy, seeing how the pelvic floor is put together. Um, I, I know I have, I have, uh, women in my life who, um, really were because they're of a generation, like did not understand their own anatomy did not know how everything kind of 
where and you know where it lived and what it was next to and and and, and you know these are women who had babies and sex and like all of this and um it, it is okay. It is, I, I think that, you know, and learning to use terms, like one of the things that I've really come to learn since all of this is the difference between my vulva and my vagina. And that those are very different things. And that, you know, even things like what you wash with can, if you're experiencing say vaginal atrophy and you have that thinning of the tissue and that, you know, certain, a lot of soaps will cause extreme discomfort. And so finding things that are gentle enough, um, really washing, you know, washing kind of the outside and the vulva and that the vagina, you know, I've been told, and maybe, maybe Dr. Olson has an opinion on this, but that, you know, the, the vagina itself doesn't need to be cleaned in the same way that we think of maybe our rectum or our armpits or anything else that, you know, that, that the, in society, in culture, we have been brought up to believe, you know, it's like, douching and all these things that we have to keep the vagina, you know, smelling like a rose and clean and whatever. And our vaginas are really natural. And, and so, um, getting familiar with them, getting comfortable with them and being able to bring, um, health back to them so that they, you know, at at the very least don't cause you discomfort or disease. Um, and at the most, hopefully bring you pleasure and, and all that they're also equipped to do. Right. Um, and so, um, there is a book out there, uh, again, this is just personal recommendation, but, uh, Dr. Jen Gunter wrote a book called the vagina Bible. And, you know, she's got some pretty strong opinions on certain things, but I find her quite funny to follow. And her book is absolutely enlightening. The things you thought you knew about your anatomy and how things work you will learn some new stuff still. And so, um, I just want to, I just want to put that out there because I don't want anyone on this call to feel, um, ashamed or silly or anything. If, if a lot of this is just new information to you, or even if just Frank talk using the technical and medical terms for our anatomy is something that maybe you haven't had a lot of exposure to in your life, that this is, you know, this is just the way that we learn to deal with this. Um, okay. So I have one more question and, and we're getting close to our time, but I think we're still good. Um, can you please comment on how cancer treatment can cause pain associated with constipation slash anal fissures in addition to mm-hmm. vulvar vaginal atrophy or incontinence? So example, I guess, um, pain meds, some chemotherapy or estrogen deprivation, and the possible role of PT. How is it different from PT already described for incontinence and vaginal pain management? Sure. Okay, so a couple of different factors. Um, Again, when we think about how radiation or chemotherapy can cause some of that restriction that we talked about in the tissue, um, in the pelvic floor as a whole, um, along with some of the pain and guarding responses that can be associated with a, protective guarding, or B, just generally being in pain as a product of the treatments. Um, then the third component would be coordination. So all three of those can drive it. But essentially what happens with constipation like that is the pelvic floor muscles are not dropping and relaxing to allow for passage of stool in this back triangle component here. Um, so that would include Physical therapy treatment will include oftentimes the biofeedback or the ultrasound imaging so that you can see it and you can learn to drop and relax. So that's that component that I talked to you about Um, during our evaluation, we're asking you to drop and relax and we're looking to see, does this occur or is it here or does it even go the opposite way and lift up? So the first thing that we want to be doing is assessing your coordination and ability to do that and teaching it based off of what we see, either using the EMG biofeedback or the ultrasound imaging and giving you home exercises that that are more focused on releasing around the anus. And then the wand can be used vaginally or rectally to reduce restriction around that back spot in the muscles around the anus to help elongate that tissue. And then we're going to make recommendations like using a squatty potty to get your knees up above your hips to put your pelvic floor in a more optimal position to relax and open during bowel movements. And then we're going to be teaching you how to properly and gently drop, which is not bear down, 
it's to release the muscle. Similar to if I said, lift your arm above your head and you did this, got it. <laughs> Bearing down is not what we want to be doing because that can result in the anal fissures. Um, so we would be teaching that response to go down and drop and relax. Great. And then I think I think part of the question too is, um, so if I'm understanding it is how cancer treatment causes that pain and associated with it, like for example, pain meds, chemotherapy. So I know we've talked about radiation, radiation, and this is true of the breast as well. Um, radiation, um, it, it, it is, you know, it's, it's targeting the tissue. And so often we can, we can experience what we, at a minimum, there might be some tightening, some constriction of the tissue. There also can even be what we call radiation fibrosis. fibrosis and that's when things start to get really tight. Um, women, especially younger women who have um, radiation to the breast will find that over the years, that breast that was that received the radiation will continue to almost shrink, like it gets smaller and firmer. And of course, then in comparison to the, maybe if they still have a, an untreated breast um, that, you know, experiences the natural aging process. Um, so, so that is one thing that could cause that tightness and that pain is the radiation treatment. If it not so much radiation of the breast would affect pelvic floor health, but if you ended up for some reason, having radiation of the pelvic floor itself, um, I would think pain meds, uh, we know that certain narcotics and opioids can result in constipation. Um, so if you, if that is a part of your protocol or routine for recovery or survivorship, um, that could be part of the contribution, definitely estrogen deprivation. I think that's probably one of the largest contributors to some of these challenges. Um, and of course, just, you know, then we have to throw in the natural aging process and a lot of these things that are, you know, with, especially with say urinary incontinence um, or bowel incontinence, these are things that just happen with age anyway. Um, chemotherapy, you know, it's interesting. Chemotherapy has a lot of ongoing long-term side effects and after effects that don't always present as quite as like, you know, perfectly evident. Um, but we, we also don't necessarily know a lot of the ways chemotherapy affects the body. So we know chemotherapy can cause constipation and, and or diarrhea when you're in active treatment and for a while beyond, you know, does that have long lasting effects of the same sort? Kind of hard to say, right? Like some people, some people have expressed that their, their digestive tract is different after chemotherapy, you know, it's just changed their microbiome of their gut. Um, so while it's hard to maybe say a specific correlation, um, you know, it's possible that it could have an impact. So I hope that, I hope that those combinations of, of answers um, get that question fully. All right, we're gonna have to wrap up in a minute because I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Does, if anyone has a, a, another question, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, I, uh, let's see, I feel like I had one more thought. Um, I will tell you that Dr. Olson and her support team are amazing. So if you have questions, um, you know, definitely reach out. There are a lot of, oh, this is what I wanted to say too, is that kind of like Dr. Olson said about, you know, that pain isn't in your head and that if you're experiencing these things, like if this, if you are experiencing these types of issues, whether it's urinary incontinence, whether it's pelvic floor pain, whether it's um, inability to have, uh, you know, what, what would feel like a normal sex life to you or the things you want to have within your sex life. Um, if that is happening, please don't give up. Please advocate for yourself. You know, I remember when I, I had my surgery first and then I was found out I was going to have chemotherapy and I had was because of surgical menopause, I was already starting to experience some changes. And I remember asking my oncologist about, about sex and during chemo and like all this. And she was kind of like, yeah, you're probably not going to feel like it. You know what? Like let's worry bigger things to worry about. Let's worry about that later, which I was fine with. I was totally on board with, but then time goes by and more time goes by and no one's really mentioning it. And no one's really looking after that part of you. And, you know, like I mentioned with my friend who's nine years out, there, there is no end to this. And I have met women through various groups who, you know, are returning to healthy, active, pleasurable, functioning 
sex lives. And it doesn't mean it doesn't take work and it doesn't mean it might not be slightly different than it was before, but it, it can happen. Um, and especially like Dr. Olson said, you know, with the, even with the prolapse, like there's so much that can be done with these therapies. Um, it, it does take a little bit of, of time and energy and effort. Um, but if, if the will is there, there are the resources. So uh, please don't, don't let people, let, don't let your doctors dismiss you. Um, just because it's not their area of expertise and therefore they don't have the answers doesn't mean that the answers aren't out there. Um, and, and with that, um, you know, the Breast Cancer Network of Western New York is here for you. That's one of our big, uh, big goals is to be able to provide resources and information and education. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't know where to start, start with us and we will try, even if you're not local. Um, start with me. You can email me at hello at amyhardle.com. Um, this is one of the services I offer privately through my business is survivorship consultations to find resources like this for you. So um, uh, we have we have someone saying excellent program. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Olson, is there, are there any final comments that you would uh, like to add or any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Oh, you put it so beautifully. That's uh, you, you essentially mimicked exactly what I say is that there are resources available. Don't give up. Um, I know that the energy that goes into having gone through your, your treatment is just so much, but it's worth it to get through on the other side too, when you feel ready for it. So thank you so much for having me. And I do, um, in Jen's book, um, the vagina Bible covers, um, primarily the inside of the vagina. I have a book also restoring the pelvic floor for women that covers the pelvic floor and all of the things that I just described too. So, and it's available on Amazon and it's also available on our website. All right. Well, I know where I'm going now to your website, because that is a book that sounds like it needs to be on my bookshelf. So that is fabulous. Um, we're getting, we're getting so many comments in the chat about um, how informative this was, how helpful um, someone commented, how much they appreciated the pelvic floor model uh, instead okay. of diagrams. Yeah, it does. It makes your points easy to understand. And, and um, so thank you for that. And, and thank you for just being so, um, you know, making this in, presenting it in such a, um, a true educational medical way, but in a way that's easy to understand. Um, and, and for, again, making it just accessible, right? Because so much of this is often not talked about. It's not accessible. And, and this, I think, will change uh, change a lot of things for, for a lot of people who joined us tonight. So um, I want to just remind, before we wrap up, I just want to remind... Um, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, I just want to remind, um, everyone that our, let's see, our, our support groups are virtual. Uh, you can find all that information on the BCN website. It's, it's bcnwny.com. You or yeah, you can find, um, all of our, uh, monthly education series to sign up next month. We have a speaker from, um, Au Natural, which is a women's boutique focused on post-surgery, intimate garments for women. So it's a great resource for post mastectomy, post uh, lumpectomy, at reconstruction, they carry swimmer, lingerie. And one of their, one of their um, teammates is going to be talking to us actually about emotional intelligence and how we can use that to support us through uh, the transitions and, and body changes that we experience. So it's going to be a really interesting article or a really interesting presentation. We will be sending out updates on that. So we hope that you'll continue to join us for these. Uh, if you're out of town, these are going to continue to be presented on Zoom. So please feel free to continue to join us and spread the word. Um, just because we are a small local organization in Buffalo doesn't mean that we aren't happy to have an impact um, greater than, than our own, uh, our own zip codes. So, um, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, we even have someone in here who, who already knows your products, Amanda. Oh, um, she says she finds intimate rose products so helpful. So that's um, fantastic. Um, all right. We are going to sign off. I'm going to stop recording now. Dr. Olson, thank you. And everyone, thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be sending out the recording and, uh, can't wait to see you all again next month. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me, Amy. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.